that you enjoyed that story and I hope that you learn more about it this morning before we're done. Uh, but I want to take just a little personal moment to, to first of all bring greetings to you on behalf of the Regional Synod of the Far West, the Reformed Church in America. As Fred said, I'm the kind of the interim facilitator, I'm sort of the placeholder. Our executive director retired in December and we said we still need to stay connected. We still want to be a part of the same family of churches and a community of faith. So it's a privilege to be here, an honor uh, to have the opportunity to be here. And I, I have a question for you this morning, a little different vein. Uh, what's worse than having both of your state institutions knocked out of the NC2A finals <laughs> in the first round? Three? Grand Canyon too, yeah, that's right, that's right. What's worse is that neither of your state universities even get invited to the big dance. <laughs> My favorite sporting event, but it's a tough season sometimes. So from the Northwest, we still have this school that uh, uh, they're wondering where it's actually located. If it's really real, it's called Gonzaga, and they seem to be hanging in there. But uh, we're not expecting to see them the last night, but they're still, they're still hanging in there. That gives us some hope. So it's kind of tough. Anyway, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about this story, and I'll tell you that there's, there's kind of two... Um, themes going on right now this morning. One is that we will get deeper into this particular story in John's Gospel. And two, maybe a little bit bigger one, is that you will never read John's Gospel again the same way. That's my ambitious goal. That you'll hear something this morning that say, I, I never knew that. I never had seen that. And this is something that I can read it differently. I want to start by uh, sharing with you that uh, where I live up in the Seattle area, we occasionally have precipitation fall in the form of what we call snow. <laughs> now, in Seattle, it doesn't take much because if you know, if you've been to Seattle, it's kind of built on the side of the hill of Puget Sound. So if we get about a half inch of snow and you hit the brakes, you end up in the water because you can't stop. You just keep going down, 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 down the hill. So people get kind of freaked out when snow starts falling and the other day we were driving home and we came across a car that literally had high centered a little tiny layer of snow on the road but it was a young guy kind of driving maybe a little bit fast and he got his rear wheels in the ditch and his front wheels in the air and he was going nowhere he was stuck right it didn't matter what he did how far he pushed the gas and fortunately he had a car full of kids and then we stopped and kind of helped a little bit and got some traction got him out and back on the road again but he was stuck without help right have you ever felt stuck not snow stuck or car stuck but kind of life stuck maybe you've had a class that you just struggled to get through and somehow the professor had it in for you and you just were never going to get out of that class. Or maybe you had a job where your manager or your coworker just were not being the kind of supportive people they should be and life wasn't fun going to work and you kind of hated getting up any morning that it was a work day. Maybe you're in a relationship that either emotionally or even worse, maybe physical abuse where you're just thinking, this, I'm stuck in this relationship, I can't get out of it. Maybe you've had a physical or a mental condition that just isn't going to change. And you say, man, I feel stuck in this. You feel like you've been stuck for so long you've kind of resigned yourself. It's just not going to get better. It's not going to get, it's not going to change. Another question for you. Is 38 years a long time to be stuck? <laughs> sure seems like it to me. <laughs> 38 years, 38 hours seems like a long time for me to be stuck. I'm not a very patient person. 38 years this man had been stuck by the pool. But I want to take you to a little bit of the background. I'm going to read the story for you. Then we're going to do a little bit of background about this story. And because I think when you grasp from the background, it takes on a whole new life and meaning. So let me share with you John chapter 5, the first 15 verses. So what had happened is Jesus had just, if you remember, the official had come and sought out Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus healed his son. And now, so it's right after that miracle. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Beth Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, can I paraphrase and say the stuck? 
one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Do you think the man's cynical about this question? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone goes in ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Well, I don't know about you, and a lot of you don't have to confess that you might have slept through an occasional class in seminary. You may only have to confess you slept through an occasional moment of sermon preaching here and there, right? <laughs> but I think I missed something in seminary. I kind of had this pose. I would sit on the far right side and I could put my arm, you know, my head in my hand and kind of close my eyes, just resting my eyes, you understand, not sleeping. And I think I missed something during one of those rest periods. It's a simple little line that will mean a lot to you, not only for John's gospel, but also the revelation at the end of the New Testament. Here's the line. Are you ready? This one you might want to write down. John was the bishop of Ephesus. Now that doesn't sound real theological or deep, does it necessarily? That's Phil lives in Seattle. Okay, right? <laughs> Well, John being the bishop of Ephesus meant, there's a map up here on, on, in front of you. It talks about a geographic location. Now, can you find Jerusalem on this map? No. Fred, what kind of people do you have here? They can't find Jerusalem. <laughs> no. Why can't you find Jerusalem on the map? It's not on the map. Where's Jerusalem? It's way over there on the far right side, down in a whole other area. It's not even close to Ephesus. You can't even make it in a day back in John's era. It was several days journey to get from Jerusalem to Ephesus. Now, if you're talking to people who live in Jerusalem, what's the predominant religious culture you're gonna be encountering? Not a trick question. It's Jews, isn't it? Right, that's who live there. Now, if you're way away from Jerusalem, you're way up in an area called Ephesus and you're not in an area surrounded by the temple and you're not in an area surrounded by Jewish culture. Do you think Judaism is your primary influence or maybe not? So John has to relate differently. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke write a gospel for people who maybe who are living around Jerusalem and the Holy Land and Nazareth, we and Capernaum, some of the towns we read about. Now John still uses those geographic locations, but he translates them into a different context for us that's I think very important for us to understand. One of the towns that John was a bishop of, and here's the Revelation connection for you, right? If you read in Revelation two and three, there's seven churches that John writes to, John was the bishop of those seven churches. He didn't just randomly pick seven churches and say, I think I'll write to these seven churches. They sound like they're really good. This was his ministry. This was his job. If you would, can I, this is, this sounds, this may not work. If it doesn't work for you, just kind of forget I said it. Would you do that? So John was the regional executive for these seven churches, all right? This was his region to work in and kind of connect these churches together along the way. And one of those towns up north from Ephesus is called Pergamum. Now, Pergamum was an interesting city in some ways in that day. There were some things that stood out about Pergamum. And as John was writing to people in his gospel, he wanted to connect with them in a very personal and significant way. So one of the most important words when you're reading John, this is the big theme here, right? Read John differently for the rest of your life. The main reason John wrote his gospel is so what? That people would believe. 
If you're reading through John's gospel in your Bible, don't do it in the church Bible because you'll get in trouble, but I hope you mark up everywhere the word believe occurs, circle it, underline it, highlight it, do something with it, and notice how important belief is for John as he's writing to these people. And he wants to convince them of a faith and a religion that they knew nothing of, really. In fact, it was kind of counter to what they believed. They had all kinds of other gods, and they had Roman gods and Greek gods. And so John is trying to build his case for them. And he goes up to Pergamum. And let me give you kind of an example, a little footnote of how John was kind of sliding in these things that were important to him. Pergamum had the third largest library in the known world at that time. Alexandria, Egypt had the largest one. Ephesus had the second one. And Pergamum had the third one. Now libraries were a very prestigious thing in those days because you couldn't visit the printing company where they printed books, books were all written by hand. And in Alexandria, you might remember they had a certain product called papyrus. They made paper out of these reeds. And if you wanted a book, paper's important. That's not a shock to you, is it? Well, Alexandria was starting to feel a little bit threatened. The Pergamon was getting a little uppity with their library. They were very proud and kept adding volumes, adding volumes, adding volumes. They were growing. They had their eyes set on being the library in the known world. So Alexandria had a little lever, a little card they could play. They quit shipping papyrus to Pergamum. What's the problem for Pergamum now? No paper, no more books, right? Ah, not so quickly. Because if you learn how to hammer out skins, you make a kind of paper that we now call parchment. And Pergamum invented parchment so their library would not stop. And it could keep going on. So here's where John makes the connection for people in Pergamum. Are you ready? You look back at the end of John's gospel. I don't remember. I think it's chapter 20, maybe 21. But John says, if all the things that Jesus did were to be written down, I don't believe that all the libraries or the books in the world could contain what he had done. Is he connecting with the people? Okay, stay with me here because there's more good stuff to come. There was a temple in Pergamum. So let's go on to the next slide, Martin, here. Now, do you recognize that sign at all? What does that sign seem to sign signify to you? Medicine, right? Medical field. Asclepius was the god of medicine. And there was a temple in Pergamum to the god Asclepius. And in that temple, or in that place, it was really a very sacred pilgrimage site. It was, if you would, comparatively to like a Mayo Clinic, where if you really had something wrong, you wouldn't go to the hospital in Flagstaff, you would come down to the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, right? If you, if you were even like in New Mexico and you had something wrong, you wouldn't stay in New Mexico, you'd come over to Phoenix, the Mayo Clinic, because you'd want the very best care, you want the, the best diagnosis of what's going on and how to get you fixed up and healed in the process. Pergamum was that place. That was the pilgrimage site if you wanted to get well, if you were sick and you couldn't uh, take care of yourself. Well, it's interesting that there is a little pool, the next slide here. This is a pool at the temple of Asclepius in Pergamum. So you checked in at the counter, the receptionist checked you in and would send you over to this, it's just maybe 30 yards, 20 yards away, and you'd walk over and you would sit by this pool and you would pray to the god Asclepius. And you would say, Asclepius, this is my infirmity. Will you heal me? And here's what the deal is. If the water moved, Asclepius would let you come in to the temple and you would be healed. But if the water didn't move, you could pray two more times. And then... Asclepius would have said no to you forever. So if you prayed three times and the waters didn't move, you were toast, right? So if someone had been sitting by this pool for 38 years, any chance you think they've prayed three times yet? So when people in Pergamum hear this story from Jerusalem, about a man lying by the pool waiting for the water to move who had been there for 38 years and he wanted, Jesus said, do you want to be healed? The people in Pergamum said, he can't be healed. 
The gods have turned their back on him. He's done. He's toast. There's no hope for this man. Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. When the man stood up, do you think the people in Pergamum were listening with a new set of ears and seeing with a new set of eyes? John had to convince the people of Pergamum that Jesus was the greatest power. Jesus was the greatest God. And they worshiped Asclepius and believed he was the one who could heal them. But John said, no, Jesus is greater. <clears throat> There's a little citation online uh, about a tour guide who was telling about the temple of Asclepius. Here you can follow along with me. There were strict requirements about who could enter. No one who was near death could come here, for example. And pregnant women were barred as well because childbirth was so dangerous. It was very important that the Asclepion, the temple of Asclepius, not lose its reputation as a place where people were cured. This was a place of health, not death. But do you see it was very artificially manipulated in order for people to be healed? And Jesus didn't need that. John wanted people to know. Who is Jesus more powerful than? He is more powerful than Asclepius. He is more powerful than your God. He is more, he is, can bring health in a place that your God cannot do that. You can imagine the attention John now has as he's telling this story to the people and they're listening a little bit more closely and I hope there's more kind of to follow for you. Well, this story is, you know, kind of at the center and it shows us how John is writing to a different group of people than people down near Jerusalem. And he asks that kind of time, timeless question that really has not grown weary or worn over time, and we still need to ask it for ourselves, do we want to be well? I don't know about you, but every once in a while I kind of get stuck. And I have to ask, do I want to get well or do I want to kind of hold on to the hurt? Do I want to hold on to the bitterness? Do I want to hold on to the brokenness? Is that kind of a comfort zone for me? Because you've hurt me so bad, I don't want to let go. I want you to suffer just a little bit because I'm suffering in it. And then Jesus says to Phil, do you want to get well? And I say, mm, maybe, right? Not for sure. I'm kind of enjoying, you know, wallowing in this mess a little bit. And if you look at what happened in this story, the man doesn't offer any answer of yes or no. What's he do? Well, here's why. Let me explain to you. It's not my fault. I mean, I think the man probably, if he could, went, what is this guy asking me? Who is this man, right? But he says, do you want to get well? And the man says, well, I can't because when the waters move, all these other mean people beat me to it. And there's nobody compassionate in this entire patio area who would make me the first one in the pool. They know I've been here for 38 years and not one single person cares enough to help me be the first person in the pool to be healed. Do I want to get well? I can't. But what's interesting is the man doesn't ultimately respond with words either. I don't read anywhere. He says, I believe. And Jesus said, okay, I'll heal you then. Jesus simply said, get up. And the man put his faith into action. He stood up and he picked up his mat and he walked. And if you saw, if you were following the chosen, uh, Peter in this story comes up to him and says, D do you hear what that, that last line is? You're not coming back here. This life is gone. Everything is changed now. That pretty well summarizes his story, doesn't it? It's a great way. And there's really another kind of cool contrast here. Earl Palmer was a, a great pastor at University Press up in the Seattle area. And he writes about John's Gospel. It's one of his favorite books. And he has a little section he calls The Search of Grace because the, the story right before, remember we talked about it was the the uh, rulers, the centurion's son, and the centurion came looking for Jesus. Where's Jesus at? I need to find him. I need help. My son needs help. Where's he at? Where's he at? Where's he at? He was on the hunt for Jesus. How far did this man by the pool walk to find Jesus? Nothing, right? He couldn't. He was stuck. But we see here this amazing grace-filled pilgrimage that Jesus went on to find this man. And Earl says this. 
We have here a portrayal not so much of the search of faith as with the centurion, as we witnessed in this official from Capernaum, but rather the search of grace. Jesus is able to find us where we are. Do you hear that? Jesus is able to find us where we are. You do not have to clean up your life. You do not have to improve your behavior. You do not have to come out from your cover. You don't have to log up 10 good points, 10 good deeds, so you're spiritually worthy of grace. Jesus finds us right where we are. This man, from the story, at least as we read it, did nothing, absolutely nothing, to deserve Jesus coming and giving him grace. There's no evidence there's any single thing this guy did. And yet grace came and found him. So some things that happen, and again, kind of reading through more of the, the bigger themes in John's gospel, is that the touch of grace produces a witness, all right? The touch of grace produces a witness. So this man, when he's healed, now Jesus, he was not a good rabbi, do you know that? He did not send this man to seminary. He did not take him into a small group and teach him the Bible. He didn't take him through a basic doctrinal course in theology. He just turned him right there. No preparation whatsoever. Jesus let him loose. How can we possibly do that? Do you know what he could say? Something heretical. And, and people might get misled if we don't train him the right way. But Jesus just turned him loose. And what did the man say to the, to the Pharisees? Don't know who he was. For 38 years I was lame. Now I'm walking. You figure it out, right? And you're going to read through a little bit later in John chapter 9, right? There was a man born blind. And he became a witness too and didn't get through seminary either. And the Pharisees were still all confused by this guy just saying, I was blind and now I see. I don't know. I think Jesus is greater. And so we have this incredible thing about how people touched by grace don't need to have this well-honed theology to testify they simply need to say what Jesus did in their life. Some of you, uh, you've had a, a couple of you have been kind enough to say you, you remember my face. I'm going to take that as a good thing, okay? Um, I was here with my friend Steve Norman when we did the Vitality Pathway, the Congregational Vitality Pathway, and we were talking a little bit. And one of the, the, uh, the key missional markers we talk about in the pathway is that there's a, people have a life-transforming walk with Jesus. And part of what that means is that our people understand the radical nature of the message and mission of Jesus that continually deconstructs and reconstructs a person's life. If you were to stop and think this morning, I would imagine it would be true. There's some things that Jesus decon has deconstructed in your life. You've had to let go of. Things you thought were, this is what a true Christian will do. And they say, oh, wait, that's not necessarily right. Or this is something a Christian wouldn't do, and well, maybe that's not necessarily right. But then Jesus rebuilds and renews and restores us from within. I want you to see how, here's another key theme, the big theme of John, how often John uses the, the literary tool of irony. So Fred asked if I could kind of fit into your, your current series, and I balked at that. I couldn't quite get a good message ready, so you had to do, put up with this one this morning, okay? But I think you're doing the I am's and there's a passage where Jesus says this radical thing. He says, I am the bread of life. Now there's a huge irony in that story. I think you could know what it is. It's not a really hard one to find out. What kind of bread was the crowd eager for, literally hungry for? Physical bread, weren't they? Give us another meal. Now how sad would it be if somebody had a whole mountain full of physical bread and didn't have the bread that led to eternal life? Is there an irony there? That people think that physical bread is more important than spiritual bread? So do you see these things? So as you're reading through, notice how often this irony, this sense of irony, is how Jesus teaches and how John is teaching his people, and it's here in this story. There's an irony. Who are supposed to be the spiritually, the religiously smart people in the story? The Pharisees, right? And who's the ignorant spiritually dumb person in the story. The lame man, right? He doesn't know nothing. He just knows how to make excuses for why he's not well. But what happens? Jesus comes to the man and he deconstructs his life. He takes away all of his excuses. 
Now there is a, a, a great book, you maybe have read it. Uh, it's When Helping Hurts. And it's uh, you know, got a lot of great things. One of the great lines in there is we often use physical and material resource to solve spiritual and relational problems, right? I live in the city that's the poster child for that adage. We have spent tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on helping homeless people and we have more. It's not working because we just keep spending money and giving them physical things. And uh, Jeff Lilly happens to be the president of the Union Gospel Mission and he has a great little radio piece. The mission has a radio ad. And he says, we don't have a homeless problem. We have a relational problem. We have more people who don't want people to be homeless than we do people who are homeless. We need to figure out the relational component to it. And that's what Jesus did in this situation. He figured out the relational component. This man didn't need braces. He didn't need some pill that would help make his, his, him stronger. And the chosen really captured that powerfully, didn't he? You don't need the pool. What you need is not in that pool. What you need is me. Man didn't understand it right then. But he came to understand it, I'm convinced. So the man picked up his mat and acted in faith to follow Jesus. But then we have the story of the Jews, the Pharisees. And even with the witness of this man, what was the Pharisees' chief concern? You're working on a holy day and you shouldn't be doing that. It negates the miracle. The miracle didn't really happen. You're a loser. You're still stuck. It's not true, is it? Who's stuck? The Pharisees are stuck, aren't they? Is it making sense here? You're tracking with me on this? How John has done this amazing job of weaving these things both literarily and physically into his story so that people will be convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one, the I am's that you're going through in this series. It's because that's his main thing, what he really wants people to believe. And so we can poke fun of the Pharisees. And again, this is a little bit, forgive me to make it personal, but uh, when I graduated from seminary, I had such a great education and I was so excited because I had all the answers I could fix the world. And I knew what was right. I could tell people. If people asked me a question, I had the right answer. It was a wonderful time in my life. And then I started reading the Bible more. <laughs> and God had to deconstruct some things in my life. And he had to say, Phil, people aren't asking for answers. They're looking, as you said, as Fred said, when he started a safe place to ask questions. They want to just know, is it okay to struggle? That maybe I'm having trouble, maybe I'm stuck. Can I say I'm stuck and still be a Christian? And so we bump up against these funny things and uh, I'm sure Orangewood has never had these kind of questions arise, but some churches, other churches have said things like, how could we possibly have a guitar play church music? and it be of God? How could we possibly bring coffee to the sanctuary and have it be a sacred space where we serve communion, right? We have all these things that kind of wrap us up because we're stuck. We had a thing in, uh, in Edmonds where I retired from where we did the radical thing and you've done it here too. The pews are gone and chairs have taken their place. Now there's a verse in the Bible. Oh wait, there's not a verse in the Bible that says you have to have pews if you're gonna worship God, is there? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Are you with me? It was like 400 years before they ever had a pew. 400 years before they even had a sanctuary, for crying out loud. And we make the sanctuary the center of our faith. And we miss the person of Jesus, who is the center of our faith. Are you tracking with me? If we don't let Jesus deconstruct some of our prejudices, we will be stuck and not become the people that God wants us to be. In the case of this story, the Pharisees refused to let Jesus deconstruct their religious biases, and so they killed him. You're coming up on Palm Sunday, and I just, I'll just i throw one more freebie, and, and maybe Fred's already, or Kelly have already given you this one. But you know, and it's, there's a good analogy here that on Palm Sunday they welcomed Jesus, and on Good Friday they killed him, right? And it's like, well, how did people flip that fast? But I want to encourage you to think about the fact there was a group of people who would welcome Jesus, people who knew him as a savior, knew him as the Messiah, who wanted to worship him, and they hailed him on Palm Sunday. But there was another group of Jews. It wasn't necessarily the same group of Jews. 
One welcomed him and one he was a threat. He was going to undermine their, their whole power structure, their economic structure. Um, he was going to ruin their society. And the only thing you could do with people who ruin your society is eliminate them. And so they did. Tried. So that's what happened when people refused to be deconstructed, when they refused to let Jesus untangle some of their biases. And it's a little bit unnerving, isn't it? that if I won't let go of the things that I think are right and other people think are different, I might be killing Jesus again. John wanted to warn us. It's ironic that people who go to church might be the very thing to keep people from coming to church. Think about that one. Think about that one. Well, there's so many more fun things to go, but I'm gonna kind of try, try to land here. It's, I, I, I love this. So this is my favorite gospel. Do you know that? Can you tell that? But, uh, but uh, you know, so here's the key thing. The goal of John's gospel, the main thing he wants to get across is that we would become disciples. The goal is discipleship. And how do you get discipleship? We connect people to a personal relationship with Jesus, not the rules of an institution. It's not how many minutes you read the Bible. It's not how many verses you read the Bible. It's not how many minutes you pray. It's not how long you journal. It's not how often you go to church. Those are all good things. They aren't bad things, right? They aren't bad things. But when that's the only thing and we don't get the relationship with Jesus, we miss the point of it all. And so I want to come back and ask you the question this morning. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get unstuck? Do you want to let go of maybe the biases that have made you feel real Christian and real spiritual, but what if that's the very roadblock to your friend coming to Christ? What if it's the very thing that is keeping Orangewood from doing what God wants it to do because, well, churches don't do that kind of thing. Now, I know you guys are you're pretty open. You have all these fairs out here, and I want to really commend camp. I'm a huge believer in camp, so if you aren't going to camp, you need to let Jesus deconstruct your bias against camp and go to camp, okay? <laughs> And Fred didn't even pay me for that one. <laughs> uh, but think a little bit about, do you really want to get well? Do you really want your faith to be alive? Are you willing to let go of everything that you know that makes you secure if a relationship with Jesus is at stake and could even take you to a different level of life that he wants us to have? There's a verse that's in John's gospel, right? I have come that you might have life. And have it abundantly. Life's another great good word. I hope you underline as you're reading through the gospel. So here are the two questions I want you to think about this morning. What's Jesus saying to you this morning? What's the question for you? Do you need to let go? Do you want just me? Are you holding on to rules? Do you want to get well? Do you want your faith to be alive? And then the sequel to that is what am I going to do about it? Am I really going to act on it? If the Holy Spirit speaks to me in church, which can happen, am I going to act on what the Holy Spirit says or am I going to say, well, that was just kind of heartburn from breakfast and I'm glad it passed and I can go back on Monday to be the person I was. Mm -mm. We really need to live into it. So I want to invite you as you go forward, as you understand the I am who Jesus is, which you know takes you clear back to Exodus, right? The God of the universe, the Savior of the world, as that I, if you encounter that I am in this series, my prayer would be that you would be willing to let go of whatever you're holding on to that's not of Jesus and only hold on to Jesus so that you would have the life and have it abundantly that he wants for you. Please pray with me. Father, you have invited us into a journey of the unknown, really. If we let go of our mad, if we get up and walk, we don't know what's going to happen. And that can be frightening to us. And yet we believe with all our hearts that this man's life was never the same, but it was never better than when he began to walk. And so I pray, God, that every one of us, from the highest leader to the most infantile believer and follower, would just look to Jesus would just long for Jesus, would just hunger for Jesus, would just want the bread of life so that they might have an abundant life that would be infectious and contagious and that the world would see this is where the hope comes, 
This is where healing comes. This is how we get unstuck. And we live in the abundance of grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.